Welcome to the 10th episode in Speaking of Poetry. I'm Rennie McQuilkin, publisher of Antrim House Books, whose authors are featured in this series. And today I am delighted to be joined by Brad Davis. Brad is the author of Opening King David, a collection of five books presenting his meditations on the biblical Psalms. Writing one poem a week for several years, Brad has created a volume that is wonderfully varied in tone and goes right to the heart of many contemporary issues. He's also the author of two shorter books, Short List of Wonders and Self-Portrait with Disposable Camera. His work has appeared widely in major literary journals such as Poetry Magazine and the Paris Review, and he has won a number of awards including the Sunken Garden Poetry Prize and an AWP Intro Journal Award. Brad teaches creative writing at the College of the Holy Cross and will be teaching at Pomfret School this fall. He edits Theodate, the online poetry journal of Hillstead Museum in Farmington, where he is also active in various activities of the Sunken Garden Poetry Festival. Welcome, Brad Davis. Rennie, thanks very much for having me in this series. I'm reading initially from Opening King David, a book in which uh, I have 150 poems in conversation with the 150 biblical psalms. I'll be introducing each poem in this particular portion with the triggering verse or phrase that I stumbled upon when I was reading and preparing for writing the poem. From Psalm 88, verse 5, I am set apart with the dead. The poem's title is My Spiritual Practice. When I sit still in my office for 10 minutes, the lights turn themselves off. I love being overlooked, first by the light's motion sensors, then by those who assume I would not choose to sit alone in a darkened room. They pass by, looking for me elsewhere. I do not care to be seen by anyone. I am never tempted to wave an arm and trip the affirmational switch. Invisibility suits me. I enjoy imagining others deciding I must be out sick or on an errand, or that finally I've, de I've delivered on my threat to buy a one-way bus ticket anywhere south and west of this office in this suburban private school where several times a day I make the lights go out. As with this first poem, the next six, five or six will be poems that uh, are grounded in my experience as a boarding school teacher, which is a rather unique environment in the educational world, but it has been formative for me over the last 25 years. This next poem goes back to um, before I actually uh, was I signed on with the prep school. From Psalm 28, verse 9, be their shepherd and carry them forever. No worries for my tour guide at the interview. We take them as they come, ages 12 to 19, dress them in blue blazers and run them ragged. We get away with it because their parents worry and the lawns are presidential. If we do one thing well, it is attending to the millions of surfaces that present themselves to a visitor's eye at each turn along the arcing, neatly bordered pathways. All this beneath broad, heavy-leafed trees not native to this corner of the state. Copper beech, ginkgo, weeping red maple, we are a world apart, not entirely to ourselves, just safely to one side. But it was not the brick dorms or landscaping, the dress code or college list that drew me 20 years ago to these lawns, this life decked with adolescence. It was the canvas hammock you said most visitors never see slung across the stream between two birches behind the rink. Fall and spring, 
you and your friends would go there and one at a time climb into the heavy cotton, pull the frayed sides up across your chests and swing, companions pumping the ropes for you, and all the way to the top you'd turn, face nothing but the water beneath you, then over you'd go, again and again, wrapped in the weathered chrysalis. I cannot say exactly what it was about that late April afternoon that won me over to the job, but I will be ever grateful for the detour. Sometimes uh, the duties of a prep school teacher take one well off campus. Uh, this is one such episode in, in my experience. Um, I hope it's self-explanatory. There are a couple of Greek words that do, in fact, are defined in the text. Um, and if you've ever been to the Racket and Tennis Club on Park Avenue in New York City, city then you, you know the edifice of which I speak. From Psalm 57, verse 4, I am in the midst of lions. on the balcony of the racket and tennis club. Between potted plants, the pots hewn from blocks of granite the size of small cars, the plants Babylonian, he considers how to bend light around himself, become nothing, or if not nothing, then nothing more than a mid-air peripheral shimmer in their visual field who hobnob at this Park Avenue landmark. He imagines becoming something spectral, nothing actually to pursue, as he was obliged to pursue the invitation his boss pressed upon him to enjoy this midweek midtown bash at the racket club and these petite crab cakes, broad tables of champagne, skewered scallops, being overwhelmed by even the loveliest of phenomena is not the same as being filled with good things, Mary's agathon, without which even the wealthiest roll home canus, empty-handed, behind their snappy black-capped chauffeurs. He knows her magnificat by heart, knows too that these in their heels and silk ties, MBAs and doctorates of jurisprudence, these too, their memberships like inviolate kinship bonds, masked with smooth articulate elegance, lives common as rice and beans. Here on the thin margin of this open air balcony, between tall leafy exotics, he thinks slowly to himself that he has forgotten so much of his life, and those here cannot help him to remember it. But he does not care that they cannot. He cares only that in the morning he will wake up beside his wife, and they will make a day for themselves that they will likely not remember ten or five or hell one year from now. He is not sure anymore that he even wants to remember his life for it would take too many interviews with too many strangers who would swear it had been with him that this or that vivid memory of theirs was made, and how could he refute it? For now, he wants only to bend the porch light, city light, star and moonlight, all light around himself, and make good from this loveliest of clubs, an unseen exit. Much of, uh, much of my time when I'm not in the classroom or on the playing field or um, otherwise engaged in the life of a prep school teacher uh, is, is spent outside. I like to be close to um, natural surroundings, uh, even though in the boarding school, the closest nature is really the park that the school is. Um, and this, this poem speaks to one of the ways I enjoy my mornings. 
from Psalm 59, verse 9. Oh, my strength, I watch for you. April again. Too obvious, I say, that black-bibbed he sparrows hots for the she he races after making a speedway of the broad budding forsythia not ten feet from the back porch where I take my morning coffee. It has been a long winter, and minus his exuberance, I too am starting these days optimistic that spring will stick around a while. All warring factions everywhere will cease their interminable idiocy, don't get me started. And seven prodigious months from now, even the cubs will own big rings. Better optimism after waking up than melancholy. Soon enough, by noon, or certainly come evening, discouragement will return like so many snarling dogs prowling the dark alley sprawl that crams my little cranium. So these bright minutes on the back porch pulling for the he sparrow are delicious. You might say they are daily bread, crumbs from a table set deep within a kingdom better than optimism. Another uh, major component of of the, uh, the school experience out there in Pomfret, Connecticut, um, is athletics. Uh, when, uh, for a number of years, I was um, teaching on the top floor of a building um, overlooking the, uh, the football field, I, I, I thought of that, that room as a kind of special viewing space for athletic contests down below in the fall football and the spring lacrosse. This poem uh, comes from that experience. And uh, it refers to um, the Okanagan. The Okanagan are an Indian tribe um, from Western Canada. It's also a river and a lake. Um, but my mom grew up out there. And so that's how it figures into this, this little poem. From Psalm 108, verse 7, I will measure off the valley of Sukkot, lining the field, to contain the action, delineate in and out of bounds, the hourly crew paints with a water-based white paint the well-plotted regulation perimeter of the boys' lacrosse field. I watch from this third floor classroom and think of my mother, a schoolgirl in British Columbia, learning the game from an Okanagan whose ancestors received it as a gift with one rule of play. Play to win with such vigor as befits gratitude to the one who is giver, spectator, and referee, and he may restore gladness heal the sick. From this room, my skybox, I call it, I cannot tell whose cold fingers tie and untie the string stretched between stakes hammer-driven in the still-frozen corners of the field, or whose gloves grip the cumbersome machine that sprays on the paint. They will receive their reward. And rain or shine, Teams will compete, unaware of who watches them. And sometimes on campus, uh, nature simply jumps in front of me and, uh, and demands my attention. Um, this poem uh, is one such instance uh, that, that was uh, a marvel to experience and was fun to write about. From Psalm 145, verse 21, let every creature praise his holy name. The poem's title is Procession. An unbroken line 
more a river of starlings passed over the library courtyard, my fresh coffee going cold. And just as it seemed the last pilgrim had straggled by, another wave, hundreds, no thousands more cleared the treetops, streaming into view, their chatter ecstatic, for twenty minutes running, wave after wave after wave. A bad day would make of them a figure for how dismal never seems to quit. Word after word of shootings, suicides, the hearts upwelling, felt as never ending of raunch, revenge, temptations to silence conscience, do whatever damn well pleases. But they are birds, not emblems. They did not arise from my dismal heart. They do not regard me as significant, even less themselves. Their regard reserved for the ineffable amen moving in each that moves them all to join the long flight south. One of the uh, topics of discussion around my breakfast table of late has been, much to my surprise, retirement. Um, these things have a way of creeping up on one. This is the fruit of a conversation with my wife regarding just that thing. From Psalm 66, verse 9, He has preserved our lives. Anticipating our retirement. Her plan to visit 40 plus friends per year, one friend a week for as many puttering years as we may be welcomed by them. After that, for one by one they will die or refuse our calls, we will lay claim quietly to public lands interstate rest stops, state parks, scenic overlooks, national seashores and wilderness areas, you name it. This is her vision for finishing as we began, debt-free and future-bound. No doubt you have heard it said, birds have their Soho lofts, foxes their waterfront condos. True and true. But we will finish up here, having only the wheels that will bear us gloriously from point A to point B. My part, to choose the model, make, and color. Switching out to uh, my newest book of poems, Self-Portrait with Disposable Camera. And um, these poems uh, are both older and newer than the longer opening King David, some older, some newer. Um, and I'll be, I'll be reading several from this collection. They are unhinged from um, consideration of any particular sacred text, though invariably my imagination runs in those directions. I'll open reading the poem, Simple Enough. In my home, we take turns with the remote, and whoever's turn it is calls the show. Rule two, a change of turn must occur on the half hour at the commercial break. If there's a question of whose turn is next, the clicker always travels clockwise. What more is there to know? We speak in tongues. We live nowhere near the water. Where am I going with this? I'm holding the remote, and it's my call. If someone would write it, I'd read cover to cover the sociology of druthers. But I'm stalling. Silence and glossolalia come easier to me than this posturing, this fidgeting with the clicker. Last night, 
I dreamt of falling into snow. My wife and I have family in, in Maine, both on the coast and then friends inland. Um, we took a vacation there uh, with kayaks and um, had some terrific experiences. This poem comes out of that vacation. It's called Love Song. She's always here, the heron, tiptoeing long shadows through tall grass and over the spindly gray limbs that litter the, sound at the south end of the lake. I cannot always navigate their tangle to observe by kayak the slow technique of the elegant bird, thin neck and head poking spear-like at the rising moon to swallow her quicksilver prey. But I do not come here to see a bird hunt or watch a moose forage or even one pair of feasting wax wings dance on air. I come out reclined in yellow fiberglass to inhabit the instant of last light suspended between the darkening sky and water. I come here to remember how small I am, how nearly invisible toward midnight I become enfolded by the skin of my slender craft. How I love to all but disappear when the moon finally sets and what's left to burn inside this diminutive form is the faint testimony of ancient stars. At about the turn of the century, my, um, my son moved into New York City. This poem is from a visit. It's called The Exhibit. Over on Lexington, in the glassy foyer of St. Peter's Lutheran Church, four paintings by M. Fujimura. The largest, a two-panel sea of blues and greens with faintly a life-sized quince emerging or disappearing. Like the entire New York skyline, in the holiday blizzard we step back into early that afternoon as we head home around abandoned taxis, pushing through the best of the storm's wind-blown drifts down each unplowed block of the graying city, no more than ten souls in sight, all boots and mittens, scarves and hats, and finally, above the intersection we call ours, maybe thirty pigeons playing mid-air, like children or bundled tongues of flame not quite ready to complete their ecstatic descent. If I could, I'd paint it. The appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord after late Turner. No borders, no date, no discernible time of day. Only the relative coordinates. West 51st Street at 9th Avenue. Though really, it could be almost anywhere. Sometimes, um, sometimes I, I like to play with um, invented, invented narratives. And this is a condensed, uh, a condensed narrative um, that draws upon experience, but an experience that wasn't necessarily mine. In your absence, I sit, she cooks. It's not what it looks like. But then, what does it look like? Is she pretty? How old am I? She cooks. I think Creole, barbecue, stir fry, anything at all other than what you won't be eating with me tonight at this counter in this small town. What does it look like now? A man, a woman, a roadside diner. It's all so damn small from the moon. Remember, we woke up that morning, men were on the moon, and that photograph, Earthrise, right there, front page, remember? They were your words, so damn small, so damn perfect. That photograph tore my world to confetti. Across the counter, 
She waits. I think I'll say it. The usual. New England boiled dinner with milk and a side of onion rings. For one, as always, she cooks. I remember. And finally, um, a poem for my wife. What I answered. It was, of course, the cancer that killed her. She and I were alone in the hospital room. You were at the nurse's station, I think, or in the bathroom, or picking up lunch. The sun was bright through the window. We were holding hands, and I had just said something about God, or faith, or maybe about Schuler, or catching the closing night of a Graham crusade on the tube. In any case, I had spoken from my love for her, and you know how I loved her, how easily we laughed together. Her next words to me were clear and soft, the tone of her voice natural, even calm. I believe she wanted to know, am I dying? Yes. It never occurred to me to say anything else. Besides, she always could see through a lie. She looked over at me, then away at the window. Slowly, she closed her eyes, squeezed my hand. No one had prepared me for that silence. I'll never forget the time she told me how she enjoyed bragging to her customers at the laundromat about her daughter being married to a priest and how it never failed to raise their thick French Catholic eyebrows. I don't remember wearing my collar to the hospital that day or why I have taken so long to tell you this. She and I sat there in the bright room holding hands. Thanks, Brad. That was a You're wonderful welcome. reading. It uh, reminds me of those uh, anonymous uh, makers of lines on the playing fields of Pomfret who uh, delineate, delineated the uh, course of action to come. Uh, you've given us some, uh, some gorgeous lines. Uh, and uh, have outlined the direction uh, we are to go and uh, perhaps uh, how we are to get there. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to Ken Picard and Karen Handeville who make this program possible. If you would like to learn more about Brad Davis and read samples of his work, please visit the Antrim House website, antrimhousebooks.com. You may also be interested in other Antrim House poets whose lives and works are described on the website. Goodbye until we meet again next month for the 11th installment of Speaking of Poetry. <laughs>